Welcome to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio, bringing you insights and strategies to help you create a magnificent and fulfilling second half of life. Here's your host, certified professional retirement coach and best-selling author, Dr. Dorian Mincer. I'm Dori Mincer, president of Revolutionize Retirement and founder of this interview series, Revolutionize Your Retirement, interviews with experts to help you create a fulfilling second half of life. So let me introduce you to Andrea. I've had the pleasure of both meeting and knowing Andrea. She's the past president of the National National Life Planning Network, lives out in California. She's president of Senior Concerns, which is a local nonprofit that serves seniors and their family caregivers. She's also a certified senior advisor, founder of Rethinking Your Future, and creator of this really ingenious deck of cards called The Cards I've Been Dealt. She's an editor and co-author of the book Live Smart After 50, which is the book that the Life Planning Network recently published. She writes a bi-monthly newspaper column for for the ACORN called The Other Side of 50 and is a national speaker on topics related to life planning, positive aging, and boomer transitions. I think we're really in for a treat. Andrea has really become an expert in this area of dealing with seniors and senior concerns and life planning. And I've been able to see the cards and actually have used them and recommend them to people. And it's just a fabulous um, assessment tool. Andrea, can you begin maybe by just sharing how did the idea for the cards come about? Just to, to give you a little backstory on me. So I've both been a caregiver and a care receiver in my life. When I was younger, at 11, I actually ended up at Mass General Hospital for over 10 months in the hospital. I grew up in New Hampshire, so my mom had to quit her job and come visit me every day, make sure that I was being cared for properly. And during the summertime, she had to give my sisters up to her sister so that she could continue to come visit me every day. And I knew what it was like to not be ambulatory, to be dependent on other people for my care, to basically not have a whole lot of choice in the foods I ate because the menu plan was the menu plan. And it really caused me to get a deep understanding of what it felt like not to be fully in control of your life. Fast forward a number of years, and maybe about 10 years ago, my husband and I moved into a new neighborhood, and we met our elderly neighbors, Fred and Hildy, there on the right-hand side. And we met them. We had a Come Meet Your Neighbors party, and they came. And Fred was full-time caregiver for Hildy. She had she was in a wheelchair. She had crippling arthritis, and she was legally blind with macular degeneration. And what started out as doing small favors for them, one day my husband and I were invited by Hildy to Fred's birthday party. And so I said to my husband, this will be great. We'll get to meet the kids and the grandkids. And so we got to the restaurant, and there were Fred and Hildy, one other 80-year-old couple, and my husband and I. And we realized as we got to talk to them that evening that they had no kids, no relatives, no one but them. And that started us obviously helping them a little out quite a bit more. And then one day we got a call from Hildy that Fred needed to go in for some day surgery. So we took them both to the hospital. We sat with Hildy in the waiting room. And after a couple hours, the doctor came out and told us that things hadn't gone as well as we had hoped. And Fred's kidneys had shut down. And he was going to be in the hospital for at least two weeks. So we waited until Fred got into his room, wheeled Hildy in there. They had a small conversation. And then Fred called us over. And he asked my husband and I if we would live with Hildy for the next two weeks while he was in the hospital. And I was commuting to Chicago at the time. I ran a market research firm. And so I called my CEO and ended up being able to stay with Fred and Hildy. And my husband and I moved into the guest room. And two days into our visit at 3.30 in the morning, we could hear Hildy coming down the stairs. She had one of those chairlifts. And she was coming down in the motorized little chairlift. And she came to the bottom of the stairs. We rushed to the bottom of the stairs. And we said, Hildy, what's up? And she said, I want to take you kids out for breakfast. And we said, Hildy, it's 3.30 in the morning. And we realized then that she didn't understand. And there was some cognitive impairment, too. 
And that started us on our journey with Fred and Hildy. We actually, over time, became the legal, financial, and medical powers of attorney. And we cared for them for six years until Hildy passed and Fred passed a year later. But we went through everything you can imagine from dementia to stroke to in-home care to hospice to nursing homes to skilled nursing facilities. And that whole experience changed my life. And I, after a few years, stopped my corporate career in sales and marketing with companies like Dole and Pepsi and M&M Mars. And I joined the board of Senior Concerns and was on the board for five years and most recently I've been president for the last two years. And I deal every day with seniors and their family caregivers. And to me, I always consider this Fred and Hildy's legacy. The work I'm doing is Fred and Hildy's legacy. So that's a little bit of the backstory about how I came to be interested in this area. It, it's so inspiring. To, it both speaks to caregiving, but just this beautiful community that you helped establish for them. And it's just every time I hear it, I get these kind of chills of just thinking about how fortunate they were to have the two of you and really how fortunate for everybody, as you say, their legacy, that, that you had this experience with them. It sounds like that's a big part of what got you inspired into kind of life planning, but is there other parts that, that sort of got you into this field of life planning also? Yeah, it's interesting because it was certainly after Fred and Hildy passed, I realized that they'd done, and it's done, I realized they'd done a lot of really good things. So some of the great things they did is that they had their burial plot and their end of life wishes in order, but they hadn't really thought about what if Fred could no longer care for Hildy. They hadn't thought about what if he could no longer be her transportation. They hadn't thought through, uh, they were covered financially, but a lot of the other decisions in terms of life transitions that inevitably were going to happen, they hadn't thought about. And I realized in my corporate America job, the last job that I had, I was actually, <clears throat> excuse me, chief transformation officer for a uh, billion dollar company. And I realized how difficult it is to change and how transition can be really challenging for a lot of folks, whether in the workforce or in life. But I also recognized as part of my work that planning was a critical component to success in dealing with life transitions. And so that got me connected with the life planning network and the work that they do because it just so fed into one of the, my, what would I call it, but the pillar of what I believe, which is that while we all can't anticipate everything that's going to happen in our lives, planning sets us up for a whole lot of positives. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Otherwise, you just get there by default. And if you don't have somebody like you, as you were helping uh, Hildy, people often fall through the cracks, which is terrible. Actually, the reason that I've chosen to focus on seniors and why I think as I work with them every day, so we have an adult day program here at Senior Concerns. We have about 50 folks that come every day, and they are generally folks that could not be at home alone during the day. So they might have some physical frailty, cognitive impairment, stroke, Parkinson's. And often I've found as we deal with both the families and then also with service providers in the community. So we're connecting folks up with in-home care agencies and assisted living or boarding cares, hospice organizations, geriatric care managers. I often found that the conversations that are had with the seniors are really pretty horrible in terms of how they feel at the end of that conversation. And what I mean by that is often the kind of questions that are asked and things that are discussed it cause a senior to feel embarrassed or misunderstood or defensive or clearly not in control of their own lives or their own care. And so part of my goal was to be able to develop a tool that could help with that conversation. So take Amelia here, for instance, who is 80 years old. She lives in an assisted living facility in the community. She's cognitively okay, but she has a number of challenges. She's a fall risk. She generally is in the wheelchair at the facility most of the time, even though she has the ability to be able to walk with a walker. But because she's such a fall risk, 
the folks in the center keep her in the wheelchair most of the time, which of course is not good for her. She'd like to be as ambulatory as possible. She has some mild incontinence, so she wears the pens. She really has a tremendous interest in seeing her family more. But this is an example of a senior that, generally speaking, folks would be communicating with either family members or the staff at the assisted living facility, and the kind of conversations they have sometimes don't necessarily go well. They make her feel, in, in some instances, disempowered. Arun is 74. Actually, Arun just passed about six months ago. Arun had hepatitis C, undiagnosed hepatitis C, which caused him to have liver cancer. And he's of Indian heritage. He has an American wife. And as he was on hospice, his wife came to me and said, he's not talking to me. This is now the time when I can have some deep conversations with him, when I can understand what's important to him to convey to me, to his son. What are the things he wants to be remembered by? All of those important conversations. And she wasn't having them with him. She couldn't break down that door to start having meaningful conversations outside of, can you get me some more ice chips or my back hurts or things like that. And if you go to the next one, this is Barbara. She's 78 and she is a family caregiver for her husband with Parkinson. He's fully wheelchair bound. She assists him with all of his activities of daily living. So toileting and feeding and continence care and transferring. And obviously there's a tremendous need for her husband to receive the right care and to be have meaningful conversations. But in this instance, we're going to focus on Barbara because Barbara truly does not have an understanding of the toll her caregiving experience is having on herself. Mm -hmm. That's, can you tell us a little of what all of these people have in common? Because they're each kind of unique and specific as, as you've been these three different people and situations, but what do they have in common? Yeah, one would think they're, they're all quite different in their situations, but actually, indeed, what they have are what I call nine basic human needs, and what's interesting about these is they're consistent with every culture, and the ability to meet those needs determines our life satisfaction. And so you see the nine basic human needs in front of you. I'm just briefly going to touch on each one. I would let you know that I called this list through a multitude of sources, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. There's a gentleman named Manfred Max Neef, excuse me, who helped to develop the human scale development, a researcher by the name of Louis Tay. And between all of those came up with this list of nine basic human needs. And briefly, I'll go through them. Security, obviously, is a need to feel safe and be assured that you know what's going to happen ahead of time and what the plans are. And often, as you can imagine, poor Amelia might not know what's going on, not because she's not cognitively fit, but because other people are arranging her schedule for her. The next is adventure, and that's the need for an adrenaline rush, to have a new experience. And it doesn't have to be going on a trip, although that's a great one. It could be to conquer an obstacle that you might have in your life. It could be to solve, successfully solve a problem. The next is freedom, and that is the need to have choices and to feel into, in control of making those choices. The feeling free to move around without restriction, choosing where to live, refusing to obey rules that were created by somebody else. So that's a sense of, you know, the fourth is exchange, and that's the need to deliver and receive something of value. So think of information or conversation or friendship, money, gifts, love, shared experiences. That's the uh, human need for exchange. The next is power, and that's being in a position of authority or responsibility. And as you can imagine, in as you get older, one of the losses you deal with often is the feeling of power in your life. And that could be something as simple as taking charge of anything or organizing something, being in control. The next is expansion, and that's the need to build or add on to or create something. So it could be expanding a collection that you may have or discovering a new way to do something. The seventh is acceptance, and that's the need to accept yourself, but also as important to be accepted by others. 
It's about feeling a sense of belonging. And one could imagine that Barbara, for instance, as a caregiver, while she may feel a sense of belonging in her own family, she's probably cut off a lot of her social support network just based upon the needs that she's giving to her husband. The next is community. And that's the need to have people around you. And it's different than exchange because it doesn't require an exchange of anything. It might just be being the cook for a family gathering or going to a shopping mall or going to a concert, having people around you, being in large groups of people. And the last is expression. And that's the need to be artistic. It can be the need to be seen or be heard or be felt. I know, for instance, in writing my column and in helping to write and co-edit the, the book, that expressed that really sang to my human need of expression. So those basic human needs are the same for Amelia as they are for Arun as they are for Barbara. That's a very helpful way to think about it, and I think you're so right. I, I, I want to integrate a question that has come from Elizabeth from Minneapolis. She has commented that, Andrea, you've already had such an incredibly compelling message that you've been giving already that when you talk about planning, is just creates a whole lot of positives for people. But she, leading up to her question, she said that so many of the seniors that she knows don't believe this and don't want to engage in planning. And so her question is, what are ways we can help seniors know that planning is a great idea? And as you've said, a critical component of success, or how do we help people think about these basic human needs? Mm -hmm. And actually, the cards actually do help to do that, so that's a wonderful right. segment. But more <laughs> importantly, there's a gentleman named David Soley. He wrote a wonderful book called How to Say It to Seniors. And he talks about the two developmental stages that are going on with seniors in the latter stages of their lives and how they are, they influence everything that a senior thinks and does and the way they solve problems, the way they address things. And the first one is dealing with loss. And often what happens when a senior deals with loss is the only thing they have is the ability to say no. Mm. And finding a way to provide choices and a path for a senior is critically important because otherwise the, their only recourse if they're being forced to do something they don't want to do is to say no. The second competing developmental task that he talks about is determining your legacy. What, am I, what was I put on this earth to do? What am I leaving behind? What, did my life make a difference? And if it did, how did it make a difference? I would tell Elizabeth that two of the things to think about when you're dealing with seniors is if you can consider those two competing developmental tasks that are going on and find a way to meet that senior at a place that is comfortable for them, they will be more open to the concept of planning. But also we'll talk about how the cards can be used in that realm too in a minute. Great. And it is a terrific segue into the cards. And I think into just talking about how to help with geriatric assessments and what kind of questions the typical geriatric assessments get into. Can you give some examples of some of those questions? Sure. One of the, and I see it all the time, we have pro bono case management here. So I have um, four case managers that actually work with seniors and family caregivers in the community to help provide information and re referrals and resources to both seniors and caregivers. And often that process starts with some sort of an assessment. We actually receive grant money to do our case management, so we're obligated to use the format that the grantor asks for. Often geriatric assessments are really intended to do a couple of things, under, under identify diagnoses and find a way to manage medication, look for depression, have less visits to the emergency room and less hospitalization. And when you get to the bottom of that yellow section, finally you get to the point of improving quality of life or increasing longevity. They're not necessarily considered as important as some of these others. We often look at a senior as a disease state or as a, a dilemma to solve rather than as a full human being who has all of those same basic human needs that we do. Because this one, we actually physically were in a room and used them. But 
the kind of questions that are asked in those assessments, let me give you an example of some of them. What's your current diagnosis, Amelia? Do you have any vision, speech, or hearing impairments? Do you have any history of substance abuse? Can you shop or cook for yourself? Do you need help toileting or transferring? Do you wear depends? Are you anxious, sad? Have you lost interest in life? These are all part of geriatric assessments that go on in our community every day. And often it's with both the family caregiver, the senior, and the professional. And whether it's a in-home care agency, a geriatric care manager, a case manager, a person who's doing intake for an individual that's going to move into assisted living, they are all ways in which we're communicating with seniors in a way that sort of objectifies them and doesn't allow them the full breadth of being human. What we found is when we went through the process with a family caregiver, a senior, and a professional and went through one of the geriatric case management forms and questionnaires, what we found is that the person that was conducting the assessment, the professional, was embarrassed for the individual. They were in that initial intake providing very personal pieces of information about themselves. And they said, I feel a little bit uncomfortable. If you're going to ask me truly, I do this every day. But, yeah, I feel uncomfortable when people have to tell me that they're incontinent or they're depressed or, yes, I drink to excess in the evening or whatever the case may be. The person receiving the assessment, the senior, is often feeling tremendously self-conscious and feeling like that their humanness has gone away and they're being devalued and often ashamed and humiliated because just imagine if our physical or cognitive challenges were being addressed with a family member and a stranger. What we found with a family caregiver is either they were sitting there quiet listening to the process or they became the tattletale. In other words, if mom said, Amelia said, no, I have no substance abuse problems, and on the side, you've got to say that the geriatric care manager, indeed, mom's had a problem with alcohol for the last 50 years, thing. or mom says she's continent and daughter has to say, no, that's really not true. Here's the fact. Or have you fallen recently? Mom says no, and daughter says, indeed, she fell last week and ended up in the hospital. There's an example of the types of ways that process can go awry. And it really, as you describe it, and what becomes so clear is how it really infantilizes people, too. It, it really does diminish them and make them either embarrassed or invisible if people end up then talking about them with them there. And it's not a relationship building. It's not a trust building kind of thing to have those kind of assessments. And I remember that at 11 years old, our Mass General mm -hmm. Teaching Hospital. So I can remember the doctors yeah. coming around all standing around me and talking about me in front of me. Yeah. And that same feeling I, I put on the yeah. senior because I know what that feels like. It's horrible. Yeah. The things that we don't learn in those conversations, what activities can the person do or not do? We may know that they can transfer from the bed, but can they paint? Can they sing? Can they, what concerns do they have? What's important to them? Who are the most important people in their lives? We talked about the human need to be surrounded by people. What makes them happy? And what do they know about themselves? For instance, what is a good day for that person? Or what are they good at? Or the way they overcome setbacks is what? All those things that really make the person tick and make them human and the kind of things we would be as a younger individual, even in our middle age, we'd be having dialogue with people that would feed our human needs. And that's not necessarily the case as we move forward with seniors. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, I can, it just re really resonates. And so now we can maybe move into how, <clears throat> both from your own experience as well as your experience with seniors, how these cards came about. But it also hits me as you're talking that they're wonderful cards for seniors, but they're probably great cards for people with all kinds of illnesses at different ages, not just seniors. Um, people going although, through life transition yeah, in general. Exactly. Life, uh, 
because you'll see in a minute. So if we want to move to the next one, I'll yep. talk for a minute about the three sets of cards. The original set of cards that I created are daily activities cards, and this is a unique an easy way to think and talk about physical and cognitive changes that may have occurred. For instance, I, and you can sort them based upon the things you can do and can't do. I can take a shower or bath myself, or cognitively, I know how to use good judgment, or I can prepare meals, or I can use the telephone. What's interesting about the cards, though, is they don't stop there. As you'll see from this example here, they have a broader description or a more detailed description below it. Take a bath or shower on my own. Somebody might say, my mother-in-law, for instance, who's in assisted living, would say, of course I can do that. But then if you go to, okay, can you safely exit your and enter your bath or shower? And indeed, part of the reason she moved to assisted living is because all she had was a bathtub in her house, and it became much more difficult for her to step over that threshold of the tub. And now she's got a wheel-in shower. And can she properly wash her body and her hair while well, she had broken her wrist? Very difficult for her to wash her hair. What's nice is as you start to have the dialogue with someone, you can get to the specifics enough to say, gee, Mom, does your wrist hurt anymore as a result of when you've broken? Is it hard for you to wash your hair? It becomes a lot more dialogue rather than are you continent, are you this, are you that. And the nice thing about the activities cards, I've broken them into six categories, activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living, cognition, home care or household chores, the five senses, smelling, tasting, hearing, touch, and sight, and then self-care, the kind of things we do in taking care of our own personal health. And so that's the first set of cards. And the beauty of using these cards is you get to a much greater level of detail about what the person wants to do in terms of activities in their daily living and what are the things that are stopping them from that. And then I'll talk about how we use the cards in conjunction in a moment. The next but the step. other, the, I just wanted to add one other thing. The other thing that that hits me that's so important too is that these cards can be used over time to see how some of these activities of daily living have begun to shift, so that somebody may have been able to do something, or just even your example with the wrist break, that th there's ways of using it and incorporating it so it's not as shaming to talk about what's shifted. It's just more more of that's just what's happened kind of thing. Yeah, and, the goal the is, yeah. 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 and the goal is to be able to address those shifts in a positive way. So mm -hmm. the, the goal is to provide the maximum ability to do the stuff that's most important to you and to find you intervention to help with that. So that if showering and getting into a tub and being able to wash your own hair are really important to you, then we're going to figure out an intervention to get you there. Mm -hmm. The next Great. set of cards, and the ones I often use first, are called the Wishes and Values cards. And those help us to discover who and what matters in the person's life. What are their concerns? Who do they want to connect with? What are some of the beautiful points of reminiscence? Things to discover. For instance, I'll give you an example. Under concerns, it might be, I need to fill in the blank. I hope that I, whatever. I am afraid to, in terms of connections, what I wish my family understood is, the things most precious to me are. And these became an instrumental tool for Arun and his wife, Diane, near end of life. Diane was able to use the wishes and values cards to have really meaningful conversation with her husband about what was important to him, what was important in his life, the things that he knew about himself. And they're a wonderful way to begin to develop a connection. So even if initially a person who's going to be interacting quite a bit, maybe let's say a paid in-home caregiver, or you just came to a new assisted living facility, these cards can be a wonderful way to be able to start to have dialogue and get to know the person in a meaningful way 
versus in a surface way. And they, they invite all sorts of really deep, meaningful conversation. Absolutely. I just want to throw in, because a couple of people have been commenting, Heather from Kentville has said that so many of the questions in your assessment are related to positive psychology, which focuses on resilience, your best self. And she just says this is so exciting, because it's really, it is, it's helping people focus on positive things or things that are important to them. And it's so often not done with seniors, as you say. It's funny, if you go to the next set of cards, which she'll really love this, Jess, because <laughs> having been a part of the Positive Aging Conference for the last three years on the steering committee for that, uh, it became clear to me that there are scientifically proven practices that contribute to, to positive aging, certainly resilience being one of them. And so these last set of cards help you to discover what are the things that you intuitively do that contribute to a positive aging experience. And for instance, and the set that you're not currently doing, maybe are there one or two things there that you could begin to do? And I've bucketed those into five different areas. Cognitive health, the kind of things you can do to that are scientifically proven to support yourself cognitively. Life satisfaction, how you approach the world and deal with life events. Your physical health, religion and spirituality, and then social connectedness. The life practice cards have really, I found one of the greatest uses are in living environments. So whether it's boarding cares, assisted living, skilled nursing, I'll call them not normal, but even age 55 plus communities, not normal places that you probably lived in your own home, raised your family in a home, and now you've moved into a different environment. This can really help to bolster the type of environment and living experience you have as you move into a new place of residence. I have some other comments and questions from people, but I'll let me have you tell everybody all, all about these cards now. <laughs> oh, okay. So we did the same exact example. So we had folks, as I mentioned, a series of folks that were the family caregiver, the senior, and the service provider have dialogue with that geriatric care management assessment, and now we had them use the cards. And here's what we heard particularly from the person who was conducting the assessment, they heard context, and they contributed and were part of rich dialogue about what was concerning to the person, what made them happy, what gave them joy, who was it important that they surround themselves with, and what they understood about themselves. The person, the senior who was receiving the assessment, felt listened to. Most importantly, they had agency. They felt that they were in control. And they were engaged and willing to have dialogue. And the family caregiver learned a tremendous amount of new things. Actually, they came away from the experience and said, I've been caring for my mom for five years and I had no idea. And often what it does is it helps to reestablish that daughter or son or spouse role rather than the caregiver role. So you get to move back into those old roles, which are so important as we age. Used as a set, the cards are intended to offer us a way to get a view of the whole person and to provide, we have to provide care. I don't like to call it a care plan. You'll see in a minute I call it something different. But if we're providing care, we do it in a person-centered way. And we'll just sort of the goal of the life plan chart, if we can for a second, we'll see that that what we try to create is what I call a life plan. And it's a way to list out the things that are I'd like to be able to, for instance, I'd like to be able to, one of the gentlemen that I worked with in a nursing home wanted to go out and take a walk in the woods. And, and I'd like to do this because it used to be one of my favorite things to do. I used to be a hunter, and every weekend I went out and walked in the woods, and it wasn't the act of shooting an animal that was important to me. What was really important to me was that walk in the woods, the smell of the woods. And one of the ways I can accomplish this, for instance, is I can get a volunteer caregiver to come in once a month and take me for a walk, drive me in the wheelchair-accessible van out to the woods so I can get a chance to do that. And one way that will motivate me to make this happen is I'll book it as a time that this is something that I really want to do. And my time frame for beginning this might be I'm going to start this next month or next Tuesday. 
And someone who makes sure that they hold me accountable this, for this might be my daughter. And so the goal here is to create things that are going to, or activities that will enable, empower, offer person-centered approach, provide a, validate the individual, provide them the type of interventions they need so that they can expand their physical abilities. That's what the goal of the cards is. No, it, it does sound that way. But what, so Dick from Connecticut asks, particularly in relation to the activities of daily living, what, how do you deal with it if a person is in denial? And this happens sometimes. Frankly, it does. But if what we find is that if you move that conversation to the, how do I want to say it, the possible opportunity of what can be done if you can fix that situation. So I'll give you an example. If dad says that he's um, physically able to walk without a walker and you say, dad, I noticed, for instance, that, and dad's in denial. So one of the cards says, I'm able to walk unassisted for X, Y, Z, C, or something like that. The conversation might be, Dad, I noticed that you're really only walking from the kitchen to the bedroom to the living room and you're holding on to all the furniture when you do that. I know you used to love X. Let's say it's going to the library. And I noticed you haven't been doing that. Is there a way that we can find for you to get to the library on a more frequent basis and to be able to walk among the books? And sometimes it's about finding that thing that is important to them, and you find that out through the wishes and values card, and then you can tie that in with, it's not always easy, believe me, this is not a slam dunk. There are going to be folks that are in denial, and you're not going to get them out of denial until a crisis occurs, and then there's no choice but to intervene. But that is a way to use both the wishes and values cards and the other cards together. And it really speaks to what you were saying before of that you said from your own experience, you tend to use the wishes and values cards first. And I can, because it really does with the openness of the questions, it just opens people more. And so then there, it would make sense that maybe with a bit of that relationship uh, building and saying, this is what's important to me, then maybe you have a little bit more leverage in terms of the reality kind of things they can and can't do. Mm-hmm. Great. Keep going. And then I have some other questions here. But just to get a sense of how this benefits, the thing we hear from the folks that are either the client, the senior, or the family working with them is that this is, boy, I'm way more engaged with my dad or my mom than I ever had been before. This has allowed me, as I mentioned, rich dialogue. The seniors are coming back and saying, gosh, at least now I think people get me. They understand what's important to me. We do find that it is restoring dignity to the person who might feel very undignified as they're getting questions asked about their physical infirmities. It's very values-based, and it explores what's important for their own growth and joy. And what's lovely about the cards is they, it really emphasizes personal development in any age. I've used the Wishes and Values cards and the Life Practice cards on 85-year-olds. And so it's, it means everybody is still growing. If you're on this earth and you're alive, you're still growing. The benefits for the family caregiver, I think I have that one next, or actually to the service provider, what we heard clearly from them is this is a definite opportunity to interact and engage with the family, and particularly when dealing with in-home care or physical therapy, occupational therapy, great ways to understand what really can be done, can't be done physically, and how to motivate folks to get those things done. It underscores the level of care that's really needed because it's not a check off the box. I find it fascinating. My mother-in-law is an assisted living in New Jersey, paid for by Medicaid in New Jersey, since she didn't have a penny left after caring for her husband with dementia for a number of years. And all it took for her to get into that program was a five check-off-the-box item. I was blown away. They had no idea of what she could do or couldn't do. And actually, she's mildly impaired. She's not hugely impaired. 
But I just thought it was fascinating. They really didn't know whether she could use the telephone, whether she could do her own laundry, things like that. It provides an opportunity for the caregiver to bond with the client, and it, it identifies over time, as you mentioned, Dory, you can continue to use the cards to understand what has changed and what new interventions might be necessary. Let me just take two seconds on the family caregiver. When we provide the daily activity cards to a family caregiver and we ask them to sort them based upon the things that their loved one can do and can't do, I would say 80% of the time the caregiver breaks down crying because they had no clue the level of care they are providing to a loved one. It helps them to understand how much they're doing, and it helps them to understand the level of burden and the stress level they're dealing with and what duties that need to be managed over time. But then we throw in the wishes and values cards and the life practice cards, and what we find is that they discover new ways to care for themselves, and that becomes a really a lightning rod for the family caregiver. Mm -hmm. The, the the other thing I just wanted to comment on before I bring in some of the other questions is it, it's so aligned also with helping people talk about end-of-life issues and wishes, particularly this wishes and values. There are some that really help people get that conversation going of what's important and how do I want both to live, but also how do I want to die? Yeah, yeah. absolutely it does. So I just wanted to comment on that, too. Let, let me integrate. Many people are saying, how do we get these cards? And, so if you go uh, to we, the next slide for a minute, can, <laughs> you can get the card. Oh, I'm sorry. One more, maybe. Um, you can get the That's cards at thecardsivebeendealt.com. And so just www.thecardsivebeendealt.com. And you can order them online. I think they're fairly affordable. Frankly, I wanted to be able to, I'm almost selling them a cost because honestly, this is the concept important for me to get out there. That's the most important thing. They're easily found online. Because we have representatives from different parts of the world here. And in fact, Heather, from who's in Canada, who's got a medical background, she's a doctor, said she wants to really introduce it to local assisted living centers, the geriatric programs, the medical school. So I think it's off and running. <laughs> There's also Elizabeth, first of all, wanted to thank you for your wonderful response to her question earlier about the importance of life planning and really appreciates the mention of David Sol Soli's book, How to Say It to Seniors. I've read that book and it's a really helpful book. So I do also encourage that. So she has another question and commented that you just are right on with the process of assessments that you've described. And she just wondered, and I could see pros and cons to it, she wonders, is it better not to have other family members present maybe early on with it so that there's not putting somebody in that tell, cattle, I can't even say it, tattling role or something? So she just wondered from your experience, or does it just depend on the family? So that's one of her it questions. It depends on the family. I okay. think often we find here that a senior who's accompanied by her daughter or son or even particularly adult child is feeling nervous about the whole. This is If we think that it, it was tough during our teenage years or raising our families or let me tell you folks, as, as I watch people come in and out of here every day, this can be one of the most complex times and, and, in a person's life, in, in their seniorhood here. And part of the challenge is while we've achieved some wisdom and some experience and things that can really help us make determinations, this is also a, a, we have a confusing array of decisions to make. Often seniors find comfort in having a family member with them and being able to have that dialogue. But yeah, if I were with my mother-in-law and we were at the doctor's, here's a perfect example. So my mother-in-law has had alcohol problems her whole life. And so the doctor said, any issue with alcohol? And my mother-in-law, Irish lady that she is, no, I just have a wee drink every so often. It's not a problem at all. And so I look at the doctor because now we're going to be making med medication decisions and things like this. And I said, Mary's with us now for six months. And then when she goes home, things change. She has a lot more control and a lot more freedom. And if she chose to have more drinks, she will. 
and that's been a little bit of a continuing challenge. So that was my response to the doctor. I try to be as nice and kind as I can be, but I felt it was important for that doctor to know. Anyway, I do think that, but baby boomers, we're a tough crowd. As adult children caring for an aging parent, we want to fix it. Another quote that David Soley has that he says is, earlier in our life we have problems. Later in our life we have dilemmas. Dilemmas can't be solved. They can only be managed. That's good. A couple more things. Elizabeth also wondered, are the standardized questions really just about like health insurance and long-term care to see if coverage can be assessed? Is it really around the, those, those logistical things and not about the person? Yeah. No, what's really interesting is, so they want to understand psychosocial behavior as much as they do physical challenges and cognitive challenges and that sort of thing. Early on, before, after Fred and Hildy had passed, but before I really knew what I wanted to do, I went to a couple of national professional geriatric care management association conferences. And one of the things I thought at that conference was a set of all the geriatric care management assessment forms. And... I would tell you, and I got them from assisted living facilities. I got them from in-home care agencies. And, of course, they have an agenda, right? Their agenda is I got to make sure that all your needs are being covered in whatever my service is that I'm offering. But often they're asking questions, what do you like to do, Mrs. Jones? I I just toured a new facility the other day, and, of course, it's a memory care unit, and they have the memory boxes that are out in front of everybody's room so you can see Edith when she was a young woman and pictures of her three kids as children and her picture of her dog and that sort of thing. All great. But if, and it can start some basic conversations. Oh, Edith, you had a dog when you were younger or, but never gets to the level of the person. Oh, I think that, and that's what so beautifully your cards get to. But how else can the positive aging community use cards like this? Andrea, you might have some other thoughts, too, and I would invite people to send me some, just if you're online, send me some thoughts that I can share, because it would be nice to hear other people's thoughts on how it could be used. I think Heather has mentioned she really wants to bring these cards to local assisted living centers, medical schools, local geriatric programs. I know when in the geriatric course that I teach, I've introduced the uh, nurses that are in the course and the other um, professionals that are in the course to the cards. And I've, I've used them with clients. They're also great with teenagers, I must say. So the, the, what the daily activity things, <laughs> I actually pulled out a few of the cards in relation to my son, <laughs> as well as the wishes and values. But what about in the positive aging community. Do people have ideas and how else have you been seeing them used, Andrea? Because I think you've been presenting and getting it out there. What kind of feedback have you been getting? I've been getting feedback from counselors that they're Mm -hmm. using them in their one-on-one conversations with older adults. I've had folks tell me that they're using them in age 55 plus communities to build a bond between individuals and also the concierge at the age 55 plus community is using it to help to understand what services some of the folks in the community might need. So those are two ways in addition to. Mm -hmm. Great. Others, I would invite people, if you have some ideas as you've been hearing this, to either send them in now so that we can talk about them together and or let me know, let Andrea know so that there can be more dialogue about how it can be used. The one thing I'd say, too, is that we've created a course here at Senior Concerns, a professional series course called From Argument to Agreement. And the subtitle is Building Positive Outcomes for Seniors and Their Families. And we've done that in conjunction with Vicki Kind, who I know you know, Dory. And Vicki's a bioethicist, an amazing woman. And we're also utilizing the cards in that course, and their CEUs offered mm. for nurses. We're excited about seeing how that comes up in October, excited to see how that goes. Is that an online course or an in-person course? No, it's an in-person course. But in-person. who knows? The yeah. sky's the limit, yeah. right? 
Yeah, absolutely. With technology, it sounds having an online kind of course like that of really help having people just focus in on the cards. I would imagine even a lot of people on this call might love the opportunity to really work with you or other people that are using them on 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 ways to to really use the cards and expand on them. So I would recommend that you think about doing that. Yeah. Other. I haven't gotten any other questions from people. I wonder, maybe you could share a little bit more of just a few examples of the cards. Are there others? Sure. Are there some uh, that, and then we can go ahead. Yep. Sure. Again, here's a – and these were – as I was creating these, my mother-in-law was living with me, and proud Irish woman that she is, who said, ah, what's wrong with you? There's nothing wrong with me, Andrea. But she, daily activities cards, can I use the restroom on my own? And, of course, my mother-in-law would say yes. And then I said, so let's talk about that, Mary. For instance, it would mean removing her clothing. Because she, during one time, broken both her wrist and her shoulder, it's really hard for her to get her shirt off. Not that you need that for restroom. But being able to clean herself. Her Again, the arm that she used to wipe herself, not to get graphic, but just to give you a sense, was the same one that had been broken. It had become harder and harder for her over time to be able to clean herself as a part of that process. Once we started to talk about that, we found other ways that we could, day ways and things that we could make things happen that would be easier on her. Others, to give you some, bear with me, I'm grabbing my cards here. Some of the wishes and values cards, which I, one thing I admire in other people is, I feel creative when. It gives me satisfaction when I can do blank for someone else. One of the things that we found is that is just so important is to be able to contribute back. And let's see. And then some of the life practice cards to give you a sense. I see the humor in life. I'm realistic uh, and keep things in perspective. I take responsibility for my life. I know and use my strengths. I live my values every day. I surround myself with friends and family who offer me help and encouragement, just to give you an example. That's great. Dick asks, Dick from Connecticut asks, can you give an example of how you use the cards? Do people draw certain cards, like in a card game, or how do you use them with people? What are the different ways that you use them? Yeah. Often, as I mentioned, I start with wishes and values, and I pick a couple that, based upon what little I know of that person that I think might resonate with them and see if I can get some dialogue going. And then I, I have a subset of cards for the daily activities that get to the basics. And for instance, often folks lose their ability to do IADLs, instrumental activities of daily living, before they lose their ability to do an ADL, unless they've had a traumatic brain injury or a stroke or something like that. The ability to manage money, the ability to do your own shopping, create a list, carry your items, successfully pay for your items transportation back and forth. Those are the kind of things that seem to go first in terms of abilities to perform activities. And so I'll pull out the IADLs and I'll start a conversation around those. And so those are two of the ways I start the conversations. Often I use the life practice cards as we get deeper into a relationship because then I'm talking about building a greater quality of life. And there are things we intuitively do and others that we don't think about. And sometimes just bringing those things that we don't think about to light can really make all the difference in the world for folks. For instance, if recognizing that resilience is critically important, we all know this, right, because we're on the call and we're professionals and all of us. Not all, every, not everybody on the call is professional. Okay. Both. But many of us have a good yeah. understanding of, right. or think we have a good understanding of what it takes. Yeah to have positive aging experience, but indeed being able to identify a couple of those key skills that, and often we'll find ones that folks are having difficulty with and have con conversation around that. For instance, if a person is sequestered themselves in an assisted living facility, really not interacting, really not doing much, uh, one of the life practice cards is I do community service. 
Okay, so we start to have a conversation around what strengths do you have? What skills do you have? How can you contribute back? People say I'm in a wheelchair. So what? Do you, can you talk? Can, what is it that, are you a great singer? Do you paint? How do you, who can you help? What did you do in your earlier life that you can provide some contribution today? And that just ends up really, what's the word I want to use, providing such a context of uh, ability to be validated and to feel a contributing member of society again. Right. Yep. So their self-esteem and their sense of being able to contribute and have an impact. Yep. Yep. I, I, I'm thinking, too, I, I can't remember where it was, but maybe it was one of these calls, too, when it was pointed out. And it's so true that sometimes when people are resistant to using a wheelchair or the walker, but actually can get in touch with how hard it is to get anywhere and how freeing it can be if they actually let themselves use the wheelchair or use the walker so that they can do some of the things you want. Just, I think your example of the person getting to the library and then being able to use the energy he had to walk among the books rather than not either being able to get there or all the energy gets used up getting there and then they can't be in the library. There are just so many ways to break it down and be helpful to people. Yeah. One other final oh, question that I want you to pull it together is it's part of the how, how can it be used in other areas. And Elizabeth from Minneapolis has said she can just imagine so many different settings, like in local communities with groups such as SHIFT, which is in Minneapolis, community education classes, assisted living facilities. And she said she can think of lots of places and would like to provide courses on it. And she is also, just so that she's offered and said she's very happy to work with you, Andrea, to help you accomplish an online course. So wow. uh, you can Perfect. partner with Elizabeth, who's so terrific with all these technical, technological things. So I think it would be wonderful because I, I am just, I think it's such a fabulous set of cards that you've dealt. And I really do want to bring it to the world, which is what I'm trying to do. I just, I think that you are helping make the process of dealing with older people have so much more dignity. And I'm just hoping it's going to have widespread use because it really just speaks to when we get older, we're still people. And that gets lost sight of. And people can lose sight of it for themselves and the people around can lose sight. And this just keeps that humanness going. And it's just so wonderful. So I, I really want to congratulate you on having developed this and just understanding how from your early experience being having to be dependent and ill and in, in, in that situation has led to this kind of coming full circle of developing this assessment for people. It's such a beautiful example for all of us of using life experiences and, and reaching out and giving back and being creative. So I just really want to compliment you on how wonderful it is. And I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Any last minute takeaway that you'd like to share? I, and just to again, remind people, you will be getting the recording. You'll get the PDF. You'll get the link to get the cards. And they're so reasonably priced. I really recommend people buy them. I think it's, what, $40 for the whole set or something yeah, like that? Is 45 that right? and yeah, forty-five. Yeah, uh, or 45 or something. Yeah. It comes with also a booklet that's an instruction booklet so it shows you how to use them. And it also has cheat sheets for every deck of cards. So as you start to work with an individual, you can fill in the cheat sheets so you can remember what it is that they shared with you so that you can start to make interconnections. I often find that once I've used the wishes and values cards and the daily activities cards, we start to talk about a life plan. And again, it's all a conversation about how do I help you to achieve what's important to you now? And that is a whole different set of conversations than how do I make sure that you're safe in your home? How do I make sure that you don't fall? How do I? It's a big, different conversation. Mm -hmm. And the point is, it's the conversations, and that's what I'm hearing, and it's so important. It's really engaging 
all these levels of people, the actual seniors, elders themselves, as well as caregivers, professionals, everybody in the who's involved in the care of somebody. It's just, it's like widening the conversation and allowing a vehicle that I think makes it a little bit easier. Uh, Elizabeth, just as a final comment, has said that she multitasks during the call and already just purchased the three-deck set. And she said she made it very easy to access and accomplish. I want to thank you again. This has just been wonderful. And I want to encourage people to um, spread the word about the cards and to help people have these conversations and to have these conversations yourself with other people who are important in your own life. I just want to thank you again, Andrea. This has been terrific. And I look forward to many more opportunities when our paths cross. And I want in any way I can to be helpful of spreading the word about this, I think, ingenious uh, assessment. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. And thanks to the folks that were that came. That really means a lot. Thank you. You've been listening to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio with Dr. Dorian Mincer. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show, listen to past episodes, or download our free retirement transition guide, visit revolutionizeyourretirementradio.com. 